I'd like to spend a little bit of time focusing on not the most exciting tools, not the most, I mean, those aren't the criteria, but rather the tools that I'm most familiar with because they're in the area that, that we do work. So again, this big disclaimer there. And then I'd like to end with these two kind of challenges and questions that I'll pose to you, but of course, in the interest of trying to then under, answer them in my own way, and I'll show you um, two areas that we're working on at two different ends of the spectrum. One is very much having to do with tools, tools that help this bridging of disciplines, as, as Art explained, um, but also what are some of the challenges when it comes to actually designing pieces that are effective in the educational context, which is a completely different set of questions, but I think both are relevant and interesting in the context of this symposium. So protein dynamics, um, there, there are just so many things that one could talk about. I, I like to think, or, or one of the aspects that I, personally I'm interested in is the notion of trying to represent the different layers and levels and amplitudes and time scales that are involved in protein motion at various levels, from, from thermal motion to the random walks and the interactions that proteins un undergo. And uh, again, I'm going to go through this really brief kind of selected set of examples. One, one immediate approach is to simply say, what are the data sets out there that already give us some information on the dynamics, and, and how do we just represent that data with as, as little um, filtering as possible? This is just an NMR ensemble played, played as a movie, so pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, also in the realm of what I would think of as protein dynamics is how proteins change shape. So the whole area of conformational changes, which I don't think I need to, to tell this audience is um, intimately tied to our understanding of function, how proteins change structure over time in relationship to, to binding partners. And just to explain one of many issues, I think, in just that little subfield, there are different kinds of protein conformational changes, and there are different types of tools that let you look at those. So for relatively straightforward hinge-type motions, there, there are resources like the Yale Morph server, but there are other ways of doing this too that have been around for quite a while now, and that give you one plausible, one possible path for how a structure might morph between two known crystallographic states. Um, the problem is there are other types of protein conformational changes that don't go through hinge type motions. They go through refoldings. They go through nonlinear type processes. And the question is, how do you represent those? Um, there are attempts to do this algorithmically. And, and again, this is one of several examples. Climber, part of the, the Symbios group, SymTK toolkit. Um, but one way that, that I know I had to go about it is to start to have recourse to these character animation tools that know nothing about the proteins, but that at least let you represent what you'd like to show. And in the interest of time, forgive me for zipping through a lot of these animations, but I'll, I'll take you to just the relevant parts that I'd like to show you. Um, this sort of representation is based on a, a fair collection of different data sets start and end crystallographic states, intermediate mutants, um, and, and, and other types of data, but the actual implementation of the animation is purely kind of in the Hollywood mode, just hopefully a, a carefully implemented Hollywood mode, if, if you know what I mean, one, one guided by um, the limits of what the data tell us. Um, and I'll come back to that at the end to show you something very much similar to what the approach that Art is describing with the EPMV, where we're trying to develop tools that tr try to help bridge that gap. Um, there are other types of motions that, I mean, this is now an, an old example, but to show you, perhaps in the context of even education, how showing molecular breathing might be relevant and might change people's thought process about how interactions, rather than driving a conformational change, select a permissive conformation that is being selected among a whole family of conformations within that molecular breathing space, as it were. Um, so conformational change, obviously there are the simulation approaches, whether it's the, the I think familiar to everyone, the molecular dynamics type uh, trajectories and representations through, through software like VMD, um, or also 
um, I think I th on, on the next slide, um, the type of Brownian dynamic simulations or approaches that uh, people like Adrian Elcock are, are developing. Um, just amazing movies uh, that at least attempt to look at the steric collisions, electrostatics, hydrophobics. Uh, as, as I understand it, water is implicit in these types of simulations, which is what allows you to simulate something this big with this much richness in terms of the structures. Um, so it's, it's kind of the bleeding edge, I think, in terms of this type of simulation. Of course, there are a whole bunch of problems remain. If you notice, every one of those structures is a rigid body, right, which is not, not how things work. Um, and um, anyway, so I'll, I'll move on from there, but just as examples of the, the simulation approach. There are also approaches to try and, again, extend the realm of our modeling and our simulation, our computational approach, by simplifying how we describe the structures. So um, th this elastic network model, normal mode analysis type approach um, is, is really kind of a, a coarse graining approach. Um, and I won't go through the slide in detail that I, I took from a Tozzini review, but it's just to show you that there are different ways of going about that based on the number of nodes that you sprinkle on your structure and the properties that you then embed in, in the relationship between these nodes. Um, you, can, you can do that and check it against real data. You can say, how, how good are we at, at um, with this model, predicting what we're seeing either from um, X-ray or NMR type data sets? This is an example from one of our collaborators, Mark, uh, Mark Bate, where there are also different ways of calculating normal mode analysis. This, in this case, is the finite element method, which does not require atomic, kind of the underlying atomic data, uh, but which seems to, to, to give really um, quite interesting results and, and is a, a very a, a rapid way of calculating this. Okay, to, so, to, to switch gears a little bit and, and provide the introduction to the tools, I, I call it a recent trend. It's not really that recent anymore. I think we've been at it for about, I don't know, five, ten years perhaps, where some of us are looking to this other industry that's already invested billions of dollars in their software development to see if they have anything useful that we can borrow or adapt in the realm of biological visualization. And, and that other industry is the entertainment industry. So some of the tools that Art already mentioned, Blender, Cinema 4D, I mean, this is actually a short list of what's out there. Um, and what I'd like to do next is just show you some of the, I, I think, what are the leading examples of attempts to adapt this toolkit uh, and, and with a little bit of a filter towards what I'm supposed to be talking about today, which is protein dynamics. So there are, other, there are others than what I'll just show you today, but I'll, I'll focus on three examples in, in just a minute. Before I do that, I just want to remind you of something that was mentioned yesterday, and that is the, the importance of understanding the question of what the visualization is supposed to answer. I like to think of it very simply in, in, in these terms. On the one hand, what most of us are interested in the room, I think falls either all across the line or somewhere along the line, but there is a line, and, and the purpose of the visualization changes as you move along the line. All the way on the left, you have perhaps the, the notion of raw data viz, where you don't necessarily know what you're looking for, but you're trying to pull out you know, the needle in the haystack, and you try and find ways to still develop a visual language that will help you find uh, data that is otherwise high, hard to, to, to observe, to, to understand. And then all the way on the right, there's the much more uh, storytelling mode, narrative-driven type visualizations where it's after the hypothesis experiment, data collection, figuring out what's going on. Now you're ready to tell a story. Um, but it is a continuum. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff in the middle. And I want to give you just two quick examples of uh, activities on either end of the spectrum. On, all the way on the left, I think one of my favorite examples is some of the work that Janet is doing at Harvard Medical School, in this case in collaboration with the, the Sam Rick Peterson lab. This was part of her poster yesterday, um, where it's not about just creating a movie or even a movie of a specific um, process. It's about creating a model that integrates as much relevant structural and other data as possible and then putting in the, in the hands of the lab people. 
so that they can constantly reassess their, their um, hypotheses on how this molecular machine works based on the constraints that are applied in a 3D package, in this case, like Maya. So again, really shifting the use of visualization all the way to the very early steps of hypothesis generation and, and uh, continually, I, I see it in, in a loop where data continues to inform the model. The other end of the spectrum, this is an example, I'll give you two quick examples, not in full, but I'll, I'll zip through them. This is um, the beginnings of an animation that we're doing for Steve Blacklow, who works on the notch pathway, a lot of the structural elements of the notch pathway. Um, something where, and I'll take you to, I think, one of the, the key parts of it. Before a little structural intro of the key players, um, the, the, the working model here is that the endocytosis of the ligand in the, in the ligand presenting cell is providing the motor force to pull on the domains that are present in the receptor. And it's that unfolding that you're seeing right here that is loosening up a structural element and making it available now to a protease. So again, something very specific. That's what we wanted to show. And those are the tools that we, that we used to do it. Um, everything you just saw was very much what we call keyframe driven, right? Where you tell the software exactly on this frame, this should be here, on this frame, it should be here. You can still do kind of narrative driven animations that make use of simulation. Uh, this is an example of a piece that we worked on with Wolfgang Baumeister on the, T the giant TPP2 um, protease. And what he wanted to show here is there's a complex set of caverns, basically, that short 10 to 12 uh, MERS enter. They arrive at internal active sites that then cleave them down into two to three MERS. This is after the proteasome, kind of downstream in the pathway of degradation. And what we're still exploring with him is, is how we might use visualization, different cutaway techniques, but also simulation, in this case, the Maya simulation engine, with weighted fields. So it's directed. This is not MD, this is not BD. This is us saying, simulate something where there, it's rule-based. Here are the 12 MERS, they start here. There is a random turbulence field animating them. We have a force field that more often than not attracts them into the active site and that gets them out of there when they're cleaved. So again, kind of a, a mix between simulation and, and keyframe-based animation. Okay, so to switch to the tools, um, three examples. Um, BioBlender is, I think, a, a, a wonderful example of, again, one of these software development efforts that are piggybacking onto the existing power of a entertainment strength platform like Blender, which is free and open source. Um, and I encourage you to, to visit Monica's poster, uh, I believe today, and she's also giving a workshop on Saturday morning. So I, I think that will be quite interesting. EPMV, you just saw, it's kind of, you know, jaw-dropping uh, in its potential power. The modularity of this, I think, is, is really quite exciting. Um, and you should read the paper art. It's really good. It's, 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 uh, so anyway, I have to end with now the part where I actually talk about the things that we're doing. So I'd, I'll take a little bit of time to talk about our approach, which has been molecular Maya. So what's a little bit different in our approach, even though we're interested in a lot of the same things that you heard in Art's talk, is to, to see how we can really lower the, the learning curve that goes along with some of these high-end software packages. So we wanted to try and develop a tool set that from the perspective of a Maya user um, makes it in a, in a way that's completely integrated in the interface that makes it much easier to bring in, um, well, at least as a first step, to bring in structural data, and then I'll show you some of the other things that we're, we're then going forward with. Um, so again, as the, as the baby step one, we at least have to have the same basic molecular representations that we all use uh, or, or find useful to, to highlight different properties. And I won't go through all of them, but a biological unit builder, I'll, I'll talk about temperature factors, I'll tease out some of the things that we're doing that are specific to protein dynamics as, as part of today's talk. Um, and there was a comment earlier about doing a better job at perhaps providing documentation. And, and you know, so I, I like to think that we, we spend a fair bit of time thinking not only about human you know, UI aspects, but follow up in terms of 
how you help people to use your tools. So there are a lot of video tutorials. Um, this is just one page, actually, of a larger site that I won't go into in detail today, but molecularmovies.org provides a compilation of hundreds of um, some of the, the best cell molecular visualizations internationally in a way that organizes them by scientific topic. So it's the home of Molecular Maya, which I have to reiterate is a free and open source package in itself, so that can be extended. The mothership, Maya, as you may have heard, I think, last night from Carlos, who's from Autodesk, um, they are very interested in this space, and they have now made it, cost is no longer an issue if you're dealing with Maya and the academic community, which I think is a, is a testament to their interest as to how they might contribute to this. Um, okay, so here's Molecular Movies. I, I just mentioned that, I'll skip ahead. So a few, highlights of how we're interested in, in tackling motion in molecular Maya. Again, the, the, some of the, the, I think the basic steps is to make it easy to at least visualize one of these linear morph trajectories that you can get from the Yale Morph server. So if you go to the Yale Morph server, you provide the start and end structures, it calculates intermediate PDBs, you have a button with Maya that says, show me where those PDBs are, and then it will create um, the morph for you and it will let you switch between the representations rather, rather quickly as you do that. Um, B factors. Um, there are different ways of visualizing B factors. Um, one way might be to have a kind of a, a method where the B factor is serving as a scaling factor on a random motion. Um, not exactly the most accurate way of doing B factors, but one that gives at least a visual proxy for it. And there are also ways of doing it in a static way. I'm sorry that the, the contrast isn't great here. This is the double disc structure of TMV, um, tobacco mosaic virus. And the B factors, as you can just see from, from the heat on them, show that the, the lining of the cavity that actually uh, provides the interface between the protein and the, the RNA genome in this case, I'm not sure what it means yet, but in this case seems to have interestingly high temperature factors, implying flexibility, presumably, um, at least in the context of what one can see in a, in a crystal environment. Another area that we've been interested in integrating with, uh, within molecular Maya with the, the uh, Mark Bates lab is normal mode analysis. So we're just about there where you bring in a structure, you can mesh it, you can click a button. What happens is it sends that mesh to Mark's server. Using finite element method, it calculates the 100 first normal modes, sends the data back within molecular Maya, layers them and weights them properly, and then spits out a normal mode movie with an RMSF map that gives you an indication of where are the flexibility regions. So it's, it's an example of automation that I think um, will, will facilitate some of the, the creation of some of these movies. And we recently, with Mark, um, launched this new database, Conformational Dynamics Data Bank, along with a, a, a description of it in this publication, where you can not only have access to all of this in a pre-computed way for the EMDB, but you can, of course, submit new entries as, as time goes on. Um, I'm not allowed to show DNA, because this is a protein session, but it's the same thing, really, so I'm gonna just take two slides to say that we're very interested, and we have, I think, interesting collaborations going in terms of how molecular Maya can help the synthetic biology, DNA nanotechnology, origami field with the, the Wyss Institute. And, um, well, I'll keep it short, but needless to say that we're, we're trying to develop new DNA visualization tools that are specifically catered to the challenges of showing large amounts of DNA. So all the shapes that you see here, every little thin cylinder is a DNA double helix. Um, and what you see on the left, and, and what has evolved into its own database, very similar to the one you saw before, is a way to understand how these structures um, well, what, what, their, what their flexibilities are and what their stress points are. And so again, similar to the protein one I showed you before, this is a database that lets you submit your own DNA origami design structure and, and it will do some of that same normal mode analysis and then visualization within Maya. So, um, Brownian dynamics. Um, 
wouldn't it be nice to, to try and come close to some of the things that Adrian Elcock is doing visually by having a, a dedicated field within the software that's a Brownian field that behaves with you know, the, the Langevin dynamics that you expect. This is just work in progress, but it, it's our attempt to create a native Maya field that, uh, that you, one can apply to an environment of, uh, made up of uh, hundreds, thousands of, of um, entities, of proteins. Um, let me zip through this and just show you the motion part. We're getting close to some of, the, some of the things that, again, Art has shown you, but here in the context of our approach in Maya, you can use some of the embedded simulation capabilities to use instances and collision proxies, at least in this case for a steric simulation, where you can start to create with very basic user-provided data. So give me a NURBS plane, give me a recipe for that plane, and I might give you a few choices for the dynamics of that plane, but we can then create rather rapidly and still interactively a, a dynamic representation of it. Um, the constant question, of course, with everything I'm showing you is uh, what for, right? So some of these are for education. Others, the simulation properties are not there yet in order to, I, I would argue, anything but outreach and education, but that, that's another, uh, another topic. Lowering the learning curve of what it takes to create a, a, a movie in Maya. This is an example of a test we did where using some of the uh, kind of elastic network type coarse graining of the structure, layering on top of it B-factor vibration and creating an automated ligand binding animation where literally from clicking download this PDB to the rendered movie takes about 15 minutes in an automated way. Something that Otherwise, a Maya animator might take you know, a few days to set up with all the right dynamics and particle systems and et cetera. So we're interested in, in trying to simplify the generation of these movies as, as much as possible. So, okay, so, so now let me switch to the final part, and that is to, to try and ask these two questions or rather to summarize what are some of the major challenges in the field, turn them into questions, and then, of course, try and start to answer them for you. But the first one has to do with an activity that anyone who's involved in creating these types of movies uh, is faced with on a daily basis. And that is, uh, in fact, w partly what has been described and collected in some of the, the publications that uh, David has put out that explain the process that he goes through when he prepares and creates one of these incredible landscapes um, you know, we're, we're dealing with incomplete structural data for the most part. Um, even if we do have a lot of structural data, it comes with little gaps and we have to piece it together. Uh, and it usually comes from different structural sources. So you might have, you might have to do some atomic resolution fitting within uh, a, a lower density map of the whole thing for a full length protein. It gets even worse for molecular assemblies. Um, I'd already talked about the morphing issues, and I'll come back to the design challenges. So just to, to provide a little more detail as to that actual production pipeline, just to take you through th uh, an example of a few steps that we will go through in creating an animation, in this case for um, kind of a, a scientific tutorial on a process. So this is a movie that we did for Vishva Dixit at Genentech, where he wanted us to use the latest data to explain disk assembly, which is the FAS-dependent apoptosis pathway. Um, so we'll start by reading you know, lots and lots of papers. It's exactly the same thing as if you're at the lab, figuring out your, at the bench, figuring out your next experiment. You gather the literature and you try to make sense of it. And usually that will come to something like this that maps what are the key protein actors, what are the relevant domains, what do we have structure for, what are we missing, where does it come from, et cetera. If you're lucky from that, you can start to generate a, a kind of a, a mechanism-based step-by-step uh, story for yourself of what are the key assembly points. And, um, but already what I've, what I've made a huge jump here is that in order to show these complexes that way, I've, I've already had to do a fair bit of molecular modeling and, and finagling and, and collection of data. That might then turn into more of a, a cinematically based storyboard. How are you actually gonna tell your story? If you wanna show assembly of this big guy over here, 
how are you going to do that step by step if you want to show it in a dynamic way? And that's where you have to start with a storyboard. And then from there, you might layer on additional levels of data. So we can have kind of a turbulence field jiggling our proteins around. It might actually be nice to grab real data of proteins that are um, um, diffusing within a membrane and grab that data and map it onto the proteins in our movie. Um, so that's, that slide is just there to remind, you to, remind me to, to, to say that. And then the final visualization, again, depending on audience and the amount of kind of cognitive overhead that you're willing to, to give to that audience, uh, high school all the way up to graduate students, let's say, and everything in between, you can arrive at, at a, a movie of this kind. So, and, and to, to put up a familiar slide, at least for those of us who work with this Hollywood type software, this pipeline of pre-production to then all of these different steps is a, is a well figured out pipeline from the entertainment industry and it, it, it helps us. Um, so here's the problem. Um, the problem is, I think there's benefit, frankly, that we're each going about some of this tool development in our own ways. I think there's, there's healthy competition, there are interesting ideas. We each get to focus on areas that are most interesting to at least to, to ourselves, and we can't all cover, I think, the full spectrum. Although after reading the EPMV paper, I'm not sure anymore, but anyway. Um, let's keep this idea of healthy competition. And if there is one kind of um, intellectual property piece that historically, and I think moving forward, is never shared, practically never shared, it's the scene files of these movies. Because the amount of effort, the amount of time that goes into creating these is significant. And it's just very rare when, when people share them. So we have the issue where we have different tool sets available. We each create, our, we, we climb our own little mountain and we're left with movies and we have the scene files and we hang on to them real, real tight. Is there a way that we can still kind of come together as a community to kind of build on each other's work um, and have kind of a co common currency? Okay, and so what I'd like to just offer as an idea um, that I've kind of saved for today, because I'm, I'm really hoping that I can really get feedback from, from the audience at some point on this, is, is to suggest the idea of molecular metamodels. I'm not even sure, I don't know enough about the past to know if this was already suggested. The, even the name may be taken already. The URL may be gone, I don't know. But the idea is that we all go through the same modeling tasks, and they take a lot of time, and it would be nice if in a software independent way, we could share those. Um, so just a quick example of that same movie that I was showing. In order to create even a piece of the full complex, take just one piece of it, the fast receptor. If you want to make a full length, full length fast receptor, you go grab the two available pieces from the PDB, you go grab about eight turns of an alpha helix from God knows where, somewhere else, you feel kind of okay by grabbing it because you know, based on other data, that it's a single Terence membrane protein, it's probably gonna be alpha helical. So anyway, that orange domain you get from somewhere else. And then you do complete guesswork to connect them together. You literally draw a little curve, make it look pretty, and you have a connector. And it, it has little resemblance, oftentimes even with the correct linker length of, of what you're trying to have. So the question is, can we develop better modeling tools to create these full-length proteins or these uh, assemblies? And then can we take that and re-export it out in a file format that now BioBlender can take and throw its neat tools on, whether it's game engine related or others, it, it, it will have its strengths. And then can we export that back out and maybe take a little tour into EPMV to, to harvest all of the wonderful things you could do with it there? And I think the level at which, what I'm suggesting, the level at which this might happen is not the scene files, but kind of an extended PDB format of some sort. 
Um, so let, let me just run with that for a second and, and see where it goes. And again, I look forward to your feedback. This is an example, uh, so collaborators with uh, the Fomentin Guilbert Foundation in France. Damien is here today and I, I encourage you to, to go see his poster of their process of this kind of assembling of data to create a unified model. Um, and, and again, it's, it's just about to come out as well in, in JBC. But I think it's, it's, a very, it's another interesting test case of gathering data from multiple sources, structural sources, a lot of cross-linking data went into building this model. Um, and we're, we're pretty excited to be collaborating with them as we develop our tools to see how we can help the modeling process. All right, so this is the suicidal part of the talk where I've decided to actually go into Maya live to show you something where the code was finished at about 5.30 a.m. this morning. Seriously. So the idea, and it's, it's just the beginning, so bear with me, it's, it's bare bones, but we're trying to see if we can develop more intuitive and, and rapid tools within the interface to do some of this molecular modeling. So at the very least, if I'm doing a connector between a cytosolic domain and let's say the transmembrane domain, I know from the primary sequence that, let's say, there are 15 amino acids. They may be disordered. There's no structure for them anywhere. Homology modeling for that, something that size, might not give me any information either. At the very least, I'd like to have a linker that represents that primary sequence. That's the correct basic amino acid structure, and that respects bond lengths at the very least, if not other forces that we can try to layer. So here's what we're trying to, to do. Um, we only have alanines for now, but you know, let's do a little a few alanines. So you enter your primary sequence, click build, and it sets into a default confirmation a little peptide for you. And now with interactive feedback, you're able to grab this structure. And with Collision detection on the elements themselves, as well as additional, I mean, I, I won't go into the details of what's driving the rig itself, but I'll, I'll simply say that it's inspired by the elastic network model type coarse graining. Um, and at this point, it's really just backbone. When we layer on additional forces that come from things like side chains, et cetera, um, that very much a work in progress. But I think you can see where I'm going with this, right? The idea is that I have my, my three domains to, or my four domains to link up. I have the primary sequence. Is it even useful to try and take this approach to create these? We now have a system, and, and you know, I can just add in things like um, plane visualization so that you can see that the, the peptide bond planes are, are, for the most part, planar. Um, anyway, I won't test my luck and go back to the safety of a keynote to finish up here. So what I'm not showing you live, but what we've started to work on is the idea that it would be nice to drag within certain proximities an N-terminus to a C-terminus, react it, do a little in silico reaction, do your modeling, press a button, and re-export to a PDB-like format your full-length protein. And I'm going to address the dangers, of course, in everything I'm talking about in just a second. But just go with me for a minute. So here in this, you, you have a snapshot of one of these operations where we had two domains. The green spheres represent the termini that have already reacted. And the N and C termini happen to be close to each other in this case, but it just color codes the, the available reaction uh, possibilities. So, and it's not just for proteins. I mean, you can do similar types of interactive rigs either single-stranded, double-stranded. In the case of, for each level, of course, we're trying to layer in as much biophysical information as we can, such as persistence length information, uh, et cetera. But also uh, chromatin level things as well. So as part of our collaboration with the, ba uh, the Bate Lab, we're interested in uh, visualization in 3D of high C data. Uh, could we create a locus based on high C data that, that maps additional information onto it? So, what I'd like to suggest is that if we can perhaps keep going in our own camps that are driven with their own little logic in terms of software development, um, but still start to think about a common extended PDB format with which we can create molecular assemblies or full-length proteins and benefit from the community of other software, 
I say extended because this is not just to capture an additional set of atomic coordinates. What we imagine in this format, by the way, a format that we have to build and evolve together, this is not something that one group is gonna do, it doesn't make sense to do it as one group, is one in which perhaps some of the free remark areas that are available to start to plug in some of the rig data. So if we have a rig created in molecular Maya or that's come out of the, the Blender game engine, is there a way to capture that information in addition to the atomic coordinates, open it up in EPMV and rebuild an EPMV native rig and keep going with it? And, and th that's really the, the point that I'm trying to make. The final part is that of course, where does this data live? Well, online in a database and, and uh, that's, that's the obvious part. The, the single, I think, most critical part to this in order for it to work, and, and that I really want to stress, is that we have to do an exemplary job at showing the provenance of where the data came from. Because the danger here is that, you know, you come out of wherever you're doing your modeling and people can't tell anymore. Is this real, was this x-ray derived? Is this just playing around with an a, a, a elastic network model rig? So we have to be really good in the way that we capture the data so that it's extremely clear to whoever's gonna use it next how one arrived at that point. I'm probably running out of time, but I wanna end with the other question, which has to do with the other end of the spectrum. What are some of the visual decisions that we make if we're trying to represent protein dynamics in the context of outreach and education? And I, I like to think of some of the things that, that David has said in one of his publications what's the acceptable amount of artistic license, right? It's always about knowing what, how much to remove, how much to keep in. And, and the only way that you make or understand those questions and implement them is by really understanding your audience and the points you're trying to make. So I'd like to end in, in the few minutes I have left with a study that um, I've been doing with my collaborator, Jody Jenkinson from the University of Toronto uh, Biomedical Communications Program. And um, we are trying in a very basic, simple way to tease apart some of the visual variables that go into how students derive knowledge from a visualization. Most of the time when we're creating visualizations like this, you're kind of in artist mode, right? So you use as much of the data as you can, but when it comes time to creating the movie, you still make decisions, color choice, camera placement, all these things, that are very much in the mode of being an artist, where you decide what looks good and what you think will work. So can we go a little bit further and ask in a controlled way, well, what are the decisions that really matter? Not in student you know, excitement and engagement. We'd like to go a little bit further. We'd like to actually test what they understand better. What, what, can we, what knowledge transfer is going on here? So here's the experiment. We take a very simple, 20 second ligand binding animation. Stem cell factor binds CKIT in a membrane. And we ask, what are the different styles in which we can create this? And with testing both before and after, can we break the students into groups and then see how they, how they do? Um, and I'll, in the interest of time, I'll skip over and just start to show you immediately some of the different versions. So this is version one. It's, for those of us who think about protein dynamics, the one that has the most things that are wrong with it, right? No one else, there's a wide open vista. The receptor welcomes the ligand with open arms, it knows exactly where it's gonna land, everyone's synchronized, it's beautiful, right? It's just, it couldn't be further from reality. Version two has the same actors, but with a little bit more going on. Maybe a bit of a random walk on the ligand, some diffusion on the receptors, a little bit of rigging of the conformation of the receptors. We wanted to show that interactions happen with monomers and it falls off. It doesn't work every time. You, you, it might need to multiple tries. And of course we're doing this in the context of having to limit the total time of the animation, which for purposes of, of uh, reducing the variables between states has to be the same. Version three is version two plus a bit more friends floating around in the intracellular and extracellular space. And version four is my favorite one, and that's the one that I think we rarely see other than when those of us who are interested in protein dynamics are actually looking at MD trajectories. In education, when's the last time you've seen molecular water shown in a movie, right? So you tell them, yes, Brownian motion, it's bumping into stuff, but it never shows what it's bumping into. So anyway, what we wanted to know 
is do these different versions make a difference? And so the experimental design is we have four versions. We have about 130 students. We test them before. We test them right after. We test them two weeks later for, for longer term memory. And we ask them questions related to kind of, I, I think of it again as a continuum of questions. On the one hand, you have the more factual, does A bind B type questions. To me, the less interesting ones that we can all look up on our iPads or iPhones or, you know. On the other end of the spectrum is questions like, are proteins rigid bodies? Or are they flexible entities? Are molecular vistas wide open? Or are they crowded environments? Does gravity matter, right? It's there, but does it matter relative to Brownian motion? Things that relate to kind of a, an intuition for the molecular world that I think will apply to a whole bunch of other areas they study in, in their curriculum. And so what we find is that the students who see the complicated stuff, presumably, are the ones who do better, at least on our test. Um, we're actually really encouraged by this data because it doesn't exactly match with some of the existing things in the literature. Um, I would, I would start to, I would want to describe more to you some of the things that are actually being compared in some of these studies in the literature, which I, I think in some cases are a little bit apples and oranges. Our approach is to have an integrated kind of educational design protocol with people who are generating the visualization so that we have really fine control over the visuals we're generating and how we're testing them. And the next step with Jody is to add eye tracking data to this to, to gain a better understanding for um, I guess cognitive overload is the right word. What are the students actually looking at in version four? Are the, is their eye all over the place, or is our use of color still allowing them to follow the main actors despite the additional action? Eventually, the real version, I think, that we're going for is not one, two, three, or four, but rather a composite version that gives students interactive control over the visual layers. So let the students dial in the amount of Brownian motion or the amount of, uh, the, the, of water that's depicted. Thank you for your time.